Okay, everyone, welcome to the second lecture. Uh, on this lecture, we're going to be covering uh, just the important parts of the osteology slide deck, which is 1 2 in my uh, tinyurl.com slash Sony Anatomy Google Drive. So, in this lecture today, uh, we're just going to look at, uh, go through the slide deck. I'm going to emphasize particular things uh, in the slide deck um, and tell you, you know, what you can anticipate as far as testable material, what's important for you to cover, and what's important for you just to understand in terms of concepts that'll help bring things together. So, first of all, of course, the skeleton has a function. Uh, you know, this is anatomy undergraduate stuff. So, skeleton uh, supports, uh, protects, provides movement based on the joints, uh, also is a reserve for minerals such as calcium and, and phosphates and also is the source of uh, uh, hematopoiesis where blood cells differentiate before they travel to the rest of the body. So lots of different bones. You're going to learn all of them. You're going to learn every bump, every groove, uh, the name of all of these things, every attachment point. Uh, so we'll get right to it. There are numerous different types of joints within the human skeleton. Uh, so these are important to understand because it'll help you to understand the different movements that the muscles can make on different joints. But I am never going to ask you on a test or exam or quiz, I'm never gonna ask you, is this joint a ball and socket joint? That's not a, that's way too easy a question. I'm not gonna waste uh, time on questions like that. But uh, these will help you understand how joints move. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, whenever we talk about bone, we have to realize bone is a type of connective tissue and uh, another related connective tissue that helps give bone its function is cartilage. Uh, so we're going to talk about cartilage and how cartilage actually forms bone. The developmental process of bone uh, has an intermediate step through uh, cartilage. So there are many different types of cartilage, hyaline cartilage. Uh, the first image on, on the left is the most common type. It's found in articular surfaces. Uh, and uh, so it's the type of cartilage we most often hear about, but there are other, other types of cartilage, uh, fibrous cartilage and elastic cartilage. Uh, elastic cartilage, particularly in the ear, in the nose, gives uh, that firm shape, but also it's, it can move and spring back because it has elastic fibers in it, which makes it elastic cartilage. And so we'll just jump through some of these slides. You can look at them in more depth on your own. Uh, so bone is the harder type of connective tissue, obviously, uh, composed of calcium phosphates. Uh, so uh, and other organic salts. There are some other bones in the body uh, formed from uh, other types of uh, organic salts. So within a uh, spongy bone, we're going to see that there are uh, specific structures called osteons, which form around uh, canals. These canals are basically the uh, pathways for blood to travel within the bone. So there's three different main types of cells that make up bone. Uh, osteoblasts form bone, osteoclasts break it down, and then the osteocytes maintain bone that has been formed. So every bone has to have this complex balance of all of these different things. So we can classify bones based on uh, many different um, classification techniques. One that you're probably familiar with is the uh, classification based on its appearance, whether it's spongy bone or dense compact bone. Uh, also based on its location, the um, medullary bone is the inner portion, whereas the cortical layer of bone is the outer portion. We can also classify the bones based on how they were formed. Most of the bones in the body are formed through the endochondral mechanism, but bones in the skull in particular are formed through the intramembranous uh, mechanism. So here we'll cover uh, real briefly the endochondral bone development. So this, uh, most of the bones in the body, the long bones, um, are going to be formed through this mechanism. But first we have to understand the structure of bone. 
Uh, so these long bones have a central portion, the shaft, called the diaphysis. And on either end of the diaphysis, uh, we get to the neck of the bone called the metaphysis, and at the end, the epiphysis. So these are the different regions of the bone, and these are important when you understand the development of the bone. So initially, bone forms um, through the condensation of mesenchymal stem cells. These mesenchymal stem cells uh, form what's called a hyaline cartilage model or a bone model. So these mesenchymal stem cells get together in a tight group, uh, differentiate into uh, chondrocytes, chondroblasts, uh, and end up forming the, uh, the initial shape of the bone. As those uh, cells, those chondrocytes condense more, they start to uh, undergo a process, uh, the, the process of um, ossification, of converting these chondrocytes into osteoblasts and osteocytes. So we can see here in this second picture, that's beginning to happen. Uh, shortly thereafter, blood vessels are attracted into the core of the shaft, the diaphysis of these bone models. Uh, and in this process, it leads to widespread ossification and the formation of these Haversian canals. So as that process continues, we have uh, what begin to be uh, formed are secondary ossification centers in the epiphyses. Uh, so we can see here toward the end of the bone, we get these, um, these secondary ossification centers begin to attract uh, through growth factors, uh, blood vessels that then uh, stimulate the, form the, the ossification process. As the primary uh, ossification center in the diaphysis spreads toward the neck and these uh, secondary ossification centers spread down toward the epiphysis, uh, we uh, end up uh, forming the solid bone after which no more growth occurs. So when the secondary and primary ossification centers uh, come into contact, that's when bone growth ceases. So this developmental process occurs throughout the uh, young lifespan of an individual. So we can see, um, we can see under a microscope this uh, ossification step as it's occurring, the calcified uh, chondrocytes forming into the bone matrix. Uh, here we can see that this uh, ossification step forms different spatial and temporal uh, changes uh, which are highlighted as different zones within the ossifying tissue. So there's the zone of hyaline cartilage where the condensation has not yet occurred zone of proliferation where those hyaline uh, cartilage cells, chondrocytes, are proliferating and condensing, the zone of hypertrophy where they are uh, uh, growing uh, to secrete the calcium and the phosphates that end up uh, causing the calcification, and then down here the zone of calcification where you can see the, um, the core of the bone is being formed. So under a microscope, you can see those different regions. You can take a quick look at these slides. Now, normally in this course, you may hear from past students that we look under the microscope and there's histology portions. Because of the time constraints uh, for this semester under these circumstances, I'm not going to ask you to identify uh, images from a microscope. I'm not going to ask you to, um, this will, these kinds of images will not be on a test. We will not be looking under microscopes but it's important to understand how this process occurs. So here in this image, we can see the three different cell types, the osteoblasts, the osteoclasts, which break down the bone, and the osteocytes embedded in uh, the bone itself, nurturing the bone. So there's a second uh, type of bone formation called intramembranous bone formation. And this occurs without the intermediate step of the chondrocytes. So this type of bone formation is responsible for forming many of the flat bones that appear in the skull, that form in the skull and the face. So in this intramembranous 
formation. Here we see an intramembranous bone here formed with layers of skin and connective tissue. Uh, so this is actually a, uh, an image of the scalp of uh, an animal. Uh, and so what we see here is that the mesenchymal stem cells early in development condense. Uh, here we see they condense to form what is called a bone spicule and that uh, condensation forms the shape of the bone. There's no intermediate chondrocytes present in this type of bone formation. So here we see an image of uh, compact or spongy bone as it's called. You can see the uh, osteons and the haversian canals traveling through the osteons, Volkmann canals, which are the horizontal canals. Uh, so you can see the trabeculae also deep in the core. Uh, so here we see a, a microscopic view of that compact bone with a Volkmann's canal, uh, those sorts of things. So we can just, um, you know, give you the, you can um, skip through all of these slides, you know, not skip through, but absorb the information quickly in such a way that you uh, are getting an understanding for what these structures look like. So here's an interesting image. This is Paget's disease. So we saw the previous image was an image of uh, regular spongy bone, uh, how it's formed. Uh, in Paget's disease, these long bones of the body end up deteriorating with time. Um, because of this deterioration, individuals with Paget's disease uh, end up having very weak bones, um, trouble uh, walking, uh, brittle bones, etc., uh, things like that. So Paget's disease is actually pretty common. It's about, um, uh, about 1% of the population uh, has a degree of Paget's disease. And what happens in Paget's disease is that the bones form, uh, the developmental processes are complete and the bone forms a complete normal bone. But throughout the lifespan of the individual, there's an imbalance between the osteoclasts that break down the bone and the osteoblasts that form the bone. Uh, so it, because of this imbalance between the activity of the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts, the osteoclasts win out and they gradually break down the bone faster than it can be restored. Uh, so that's generally due to genetic uh, conditions, but it can also be stimulated by uh, viruses. Um, infections such as, a, such as a viral infection. So from here on out, this slide deck shows you um, some of um, the classic images from Gray's Anatomy of all of the different bones from different orientations. And it will illustrate the name of those bones and some of the major prominences uh, present uh, on those bones. And this is the information that you will need to know uh, as we get to these different sections of the body. So I will promise you that you do not need to know all of this information today. You need to know this information during that testable region of the body. So example, uh, the first exam is on the back and the upper limbs. So as we get through these slides, you'll see there's information about the uh, upper limbs, the clavicle, the scapula, the vertebrae. So that's the information you need to know for the first exam. The second exam is going to be abdomen, pelvis, lower limbs. So you need to know those bones, uh, all of their prominences, those sorts of things. And this information is critical because it forms the basis of your understanding for the, the muscle movements. Understanding where a bone attaches and how it, uh, the vector of that attachment is critical for um, you know, all of the, all of the subsequent information uh, that you're going to be tested on about muscle movements and kinesiology uh, and things like that. So understanding this information, you can diagnose muscle weaknesses knowing uh, the attachment points, knowing the vectors of the muscles, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see in these images uh, here of the humerus, for instance, you can see these red outlines show the attachment points of the muscles. Uh, and it names the muscle within that uh, red region. So the medial head of triceps attaches here on this portion of the posterior 
of the humerus. You get all of this information in much prettier uh, images. So here you can see uh, varying degrees of dissection of the arm. You can see the attachments of each muscle shaded in different colors. Uh, and so that gives you the information you need. Furthermore, you've got pictures showing the uh, vectors of each individual muscle, which gives you a great concept, a great idea of how those muscles attach and form those movements. So uh, this is Gilroy's Atlas of Anatomy by Thema. Uh, so this is, as I said in the previous lecture, this is your Bible for the rest of your education in terms of anatomy, kinesiology, and understanding the clinical diagnostic features uh, that you'll need to uh, learn. So uh, at this point, uh, your task is clear. Go through these slides, understand the names of these different bones and all of their prominences, their muscular attachments, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the, uh, I will reiterate as we go through the rest of the uh, lectures, uh, some of these uh, aspects which are critical for uh, common clinical conditions. Uh, so at, uh, I will just click through these slides, make sure there's nothing I'm missing that I need to talk about, and there's not. So uh, that's it for this lecture. Uh, and feel free to email me uh, to ask about anything, any questions you have, because I know the circumstances are unusual. Uh, so I'll uh, see you next time.